Welcome to Money in the Air, the music podcast about neighboring rights, the royalties you earn from the public performance of your recordings and the business of music in general. Brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. I'm Andrew, co-founder and chief royalty officer of Royalty. Hi, I'm Gina Deacon. I work for Absolute Rights Management and I work with record labels and artists to ensure we claim the royalty income due to them. I'm Stacey Haber and I'm from Inside Baseball Music Publishing. Hi, welcome back to Money in the Air, the Neighboring Rights Podcast brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. Let me introduce you to Emmy Astles, Lily Packham, and Chris Britton. And they're all going into live venues and promotions work. And so we need to help them with PPL requirements. So guys, what do you know already about neighboring rights and what you have to do? But I know it's a, it's a thing, you know, if, if everyone needs to be paid and everyone wants to be paid fairly, you need to apply for it via the website. Uh, I, when I was on here last, we talked about what that's like for an artist, but mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about what it's like for that's right. events. That's right. You know that PPL is only for when you use live recordings. So when at your events mm -hmm. would you use live recordings? I'm thinking mm -hmm. either before the band start or in between the acts. Yeah. Yeah. I think particularly for me as well with the more EDM world with DJing. DJ is going to be playing recorded music anyway. So for venues here in the UK, you're going to play recorded music before and at and during bands, you know, in between the changeover. And your question, Chris, about for DJs performing, because it's EDM music, it's all recorded music. So the information that you have to give PPL in order for them to determine a pop-up license fee would be how many people you're expecting, what you're paying the performers, and the square footage of the place that you're playing. If you had your own venue, then you would just apply for a yearly PPL license through the website, like you said. But even the pop-up venues for U.S. promoters, um, again, you start through the website or an email address if you have an account back. Um, so it, it is a very simple process because they want you to let them know they want your money. So I've done um, pop-ups for fashion shows that had live music and we build the venue every year for each show and we book the music both live and recorded and then I give them all that information. So it's not that, it's not that difficult. How is it in the U.S., Andrew? The U.S. is different because we don't recognize live performances of recorded music. We have a very narrow scope for neighboring rights here in the U.S. to just cover non-interactive digital performance, which essentially means Sirius XM and Pandora, internet radio stations, satellite radio stations, that type of thing. That's good. All right. So it's even easier when you get global. And the other thing that you'll have to do is you'll have to give PPL your set list. So whatever anybody plays, make sure you get the set list from the artists um, and from the DJs and make sure that you submit it so that the right people get paid. And is that per event? Yes. You have to do that. So say if you were planning a tour. Right. Then you would do it for the whole tour. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have to apply each time for each event. You can do it in totality. The way that it happens, and I'm assuming when it does happen here in the U.S., it's going to mirror exactly the way it happens on the composition side because the music compositions it is fully recognized here in the US where the venues are getting a either a quarterly or yearly long license to play music that is licensed by a society here we have multiple ASCAP BMI um, it would be sound exchange in the future it's very similar to PPL where they get a license for the year and then every single show you have to report what songs or recordings were played during that show. And usually it's a tour manager that manages uh, the submissions of the playlist. So they have what songs or they're expected to play, and then they submit the songs that were actually played uh, to the society. That's cool. And then once you've submitted your rep list, it's not in your hands, it's in the hands of the artist or the label to ensure that the recording is registered so that the two match up and the income can filter through to the right person. The DJs will use what's called a record pool. 
right. to basically pull licensed music from, whether that's sound file code, DJ C, there's loads of different things where you pay a monthly subscription to this site where you can get legally registered music, um, which basically stops DJs from you know using ripped MP3s from the internet and basically pirating music and playing it. But how do those softwares work with with PPL, if you, if you don't know, that's fine, but it's like... So when you say legally registered, you mean by the rights holders, the people who own those recordings. Yeah. So you still have to submit the playlist based on what you license from those sites. It's still up to you as whoever's in charge of the event to submit that information and to get the PPL license. And does it sound easy enough to you? Yeah. Yeah, good. There's just three questions you have to ask. Square footage, how many people are intended to come? What are you playing? Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming and being our guest. Thank you. Thank you, everyone else, for listening. And remember, if you haven't already joined IFR, go to www.iafar.co.uk and become a member. We'd love to have you. Bye.